I'd like to welcome you all. This is a lunch and learn session that the Paul are running today, and it's on COVID-19 vaccination and dispelling the myths. Um, so I just want to welcome our staff. Uh, we have a lot of staff, obviously, from the Paul today, but we have some partners joining us um, from the sector, which include people from Crosscare, Simon, Merchants Key, Novus, and a number of other organizations that that would work with the Paul through the homeless network so you're all very very welcome today um so could I ask uh Davina could you just pour up the timetable today and I'll talk through that now so this is the welcome and the check-in so you're all very welcome I hope you're all checked in um we're going to hear from Dr. Kleena Nikielik today. Um, Kleena, I always butcher your name, but you know who you are. Um, Kleena, Hopefully. <laughs> uh, Kleena is a consultant in St. James's Hospital and an absolute expert in this stuff for us. She's also the chair of our clinical governance and suggested this session be held for staff within Nepal. Austin O'Carroll will also be joining us today, who's the lead on the COVID-19 homeless response uh, with the HSE. Austin will be joining us from about 1.30, but he has his presentation ready to go as a pre-record, and that's all in place. And then you'll see that we'll give some time over for a Q&A. So just to explain how that will work, we've had a lot of questions in from a lot of staff across all the services, and um, both within the Paul and outside of the Paul, we invited questions from everywhere. Um, and we're going to try and get through as many of them as we can Obviously, uh, Clean and Austin have seen the questions and tried to answer off them. But we really want to try and answer as many of the questions as we can. One caveat, this is a session with the GPAs, if, or GPAs, GPs. Um, if you have questions around your terms and conditions or benefits, just a sick leave, I'm going to ask that you refer them back to your line managers um, in wherever organisation you're from or your HR departments. We won't be in a position to answer them here today. Um, I think... That is really it on that stuff. So with that in mind, I'm just going to say we are recording the session today and we will send the link out to it for Paul. It will be on our Moodle Monday and any staff will be able to access it there and hopefully get the messages as they go. For other staff from other organisations, we'll be sending this out to the Homeless Network and to the HSE for further referral. Uh, so everybody can have access to it. We really, really, really want to support um, the message of vaccination and um, particularly around COVID-19 for both our staff and our service users. So um, today is about getting as much information out there as possible to try and reassure everybody. So Kleene, you're very welcome. And I'm going to pass over to you. So thanks so much, Dermot. I'm really delighted to get this <coughs> opportunity. Uh, I promise to uh, try to answer every question. I won't have the answers for them all. And just want to say to everybody, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Uh, usually the person who starts by saying, this is a really stupid question, has a brilliant question uh, that'll raise loads of stuff for us to talk about. So I wanted to share what knowledge I have about um, COVID vaccines and really just to give everybody an opportunity to, to talk about and ask any questions that maybe that they may have or that their families may have or anything that I can help with. So without further ado, let me share my slides. So for anybody who doesn't know me, I'm a consultant in infectious diseases and inclusion health in James's. I have the pleasure of working with many, many of you and we'll have lots of clients or patients in common. So just a shout out for all the good work that you're doing much appreciated uh, and for all that you've taught me over the years. So I wanted to start a little bit by just first of all, vaccines are all about immunity. So I wanted to just briefly talk about what immunity means um, and what we're trying to do with vaccines. So immunity happens um, when you have an infection or you get vaccinated against it, an infection with a bacteria or a virus. And then your body learns to recognize that bacteria or virus and makes things called antibodies. And also, you know, other white cells have kind of learned what that virus looks like. And for many infections, if you have an infection once off, like measles, this poor little fella there on the left has a bad case of, of measles or measles, as they can also be called by children. Um, and 
with measles, you usually just get it once. So you get it once you become immune and you don't become reinfected. So in the days before there were measles vaccines, people would just get it once. And infections like that are kind of easier to make vaccines too, because naturally the way that your body becomes immune to that particular virus works. Um, and so all you need to do is trigger that. And then there are some other infections, a cold sore would be an example. So the herpes simplex virus, another, an, another example of a virus where you do become immune to it, but your immunity isn't enough to stop you getting it again. And um, so for those of us who have cold sores, 95 percent of the Irish population do. And, um, you know, that even though you've had one before, it doesn't stop you from getting another one again. So that's that's what immunity is. Basically, it's your body can recognize that bacteria or virus. And when you get exposed to it, it kicks into action right away, very effectively, very strongly. Um, and for many viruses, many infections, uh, once you're immune to them, that's great. You're immune and you're not going to get them again. And then how vaccines work um, is they kind of trick your body uh, into thinking you have an infection. So they they give you um, little bits of the virus or bacteria and get your body to make an immune response to it without you having to have the infection first. And the first vaccine that was invented was against smallpox. And that's a really successful vaccine because smallpox is gone now from the world uh, thanks to vaccination. And it used to kill about a third of people um, who got it. So, so that's the smallpox vaccine will be one of a type of vaccine where the vaccine is actually a live weakened strain of the bacteria or virus. And um, so for the smallpox vaccine, it was cowpox, which is a, a weaker virus that looks very like smallpox that they used to give people. And then that would trick their body or get their body to recognize smallpox so that if they were exposed to smallpox, their immunity would kick in right away and they wouldn't get infected. They wouldn't get sick. The BCG that's still in use and the MMR that are still in use, they're both examples of vaccines where there are live, you get given live um, weakened uh, bacteria in the case of BCG or virus in the case of MMR. And then there are some other, vi other vaccines where how they work is they just give you a little tiny bit of the um, of the virus or bacteria. So it isn't a whole virus. Uh, for example, the hepatitis B vaccine would be an example of this or the flu vaccine. They don't give you the whole virus. So there's no way that that virus can, can reproduce in your body. It's not alive. It's only a little tiny snippet of bacteria or virus. Um, but that's enough to get your immune system to recognize the important bits of that virus or bacteria so that if you pick up the flu or are exposed to hepatitis B that again, your immune system kicks in right away and you don't get infected with it. And sometimes when we're using that kind of a vaccine, we need to mix the little bit of virus or bacteria with something that gets your immune system to kick in and to, to kind of switch on your immune system so that it responds to those little bits of virus or bacteria and makes an immune response. And the vaccines that we have for COVID are this type of vaccine. So they're not live COVID virus at all. They're not so SARS-CoV-2 virus. They're just giving you little tiny bits of the outside coating of the virus so that if your body, if you are exposed to actual virus, your body goes, hey, I know that guy. He's a dangerous guy. And they kick in right away and get rid of it. And what's new about the COVID vaccines is how they get into your body and how you get that little bit of virus into to your body to trigger off your immune system is done using either mRNA or adenoviral vectors. And they're just kind of delivery systems for the vaccine. And we can talk a bit more about them later. And um, so there are some really important questions, obviously, about the vaccines. And some of them we have answers to and some of them we don't have answers to yet because they haven't been around for long enough yet for us to know or enough people haven't had them yet, had the vaccines yet for us to know. But there are some questions that we, we already have really good answers to. I suppose the most important question um, that people have about the COVID vaccines are will they prevent you from getting really sick? sick to the point where you need to go to hospital or sick to the point where you're where, where you will die and there's really clear data on all the vaccines that they do this really well so this is a, a chart you can see all the different vaccines there on the left so moderna pfizer astrazeneca those are the ones that are in ireland at the moment johnson and johnson probably coming down the line sputnik which i just think is such a brilliant name for a vaccine is down there at the bottom we don't have that yet but you can see here that in this column here uh, you can see how many 
thousands of people had the vaccine in the trials, in the clinical trials that they did. So way more people have already had the vaccine than those numbers, um, but those are what they did in the clinical trials. And you can see how good were they at preventing people needing to go to hospital or getting very severely unwell with COVID. And essentially they're all 100%. And um, so even the AstraZeneca vaccine that there has been some concern around how good is it uh, at preventing you from getting kind of mild symptoms, even that performs really, really, really well in terms of preventing you from getting very sick or needing to go to hospital with COVID. And I think that's incredibly reassuring because uh, I've seen a lot of people who were very, very sick with, with COVID um, and it's not something you would wish on your worst enemy. And you can see here, so now we're starting to see the kind of data as vaccine gets rolled out in the UK and Israel and in Europe, we can really look on a population level in much bigger numbers that would ever be, than would ever be in a clinical trial. You can see that it's actually reducing um, the amount of, of COVID being diagnosed in groups. So in Israel, they vaccinated their over 60s. And you can see that while those under 60, um, you know, there's still quite high numbers of cases that in those over 60 who were vaccinated, the amount of them that are getting sick or needing to come into hospital is going right down. So really good real world um, evidence as well that the vaccines are very effective at preventing people from getting really sick and needing to go to hospital. Okay, so that's the answer to the first question. Do the vaccines prevent you from getting really sick, uh, dying, hospital sick? And the answer for all of the vaccines that have been released to date is yes, which is brilliant in both clinical trials and in real world experience. And actually we're already seeing this in Ireland um, with a reduction in um, severe cases in nursing homes, it's just fabulous. So the second question is, does the vaccine prevent you from getting mildly sick? And I've put mildly in inverted commas because you can be mildly sick and not need to go to hospital and still feel uh, like a very sick puppy or kitten for, for a long time. And the, a lot of the trials didn't look at this because it's harder to measure. And I suppose in terms of what they needed to show um, for their vaccine to be, be licensed and be used. They didn't need to show that the vaccines protected people against mildly sick, getting mildly sick. But again, as the vaccines are being rolled out, we're starting to get some evidence on this. So this is the same chart, but you can see I put a red box around the efficacy against milder COVID. And you can see that both the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines are very effective against this. Um, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine may be a little bit less and the AstraZeneca uh, a little bit less. And that may be because they're a different type of vaccine. So you can see they're both ones that use this adenovirus as a vector uh, rather than mRNA to deliver the bits of bits of virus to get your immune system to respond. Um, and there are also, there were issues with the AstraZeneca where they made a mistake in how much vaccine they were given and then found out that the mistake actually worked better than the original. And um, so they are hopeful that their new modified we made a mistake and now we're going to use that all the time um, is actually going to protect better against mild COVID than, than their original plan. Okay, so answer to, does it prevent severe COVID? Absolutely, all of them do. Do they prevent mild COVID? All of them do to, to a very significant extent. I mean, 70% protection is still pretty good odds, um, but, but it varies a little bit by vaccine. Something we don't have an answer for yet is does the vaccine prevent people from getting long COVID? So long COVID happens in a between 10 and 30% of people who get COVID. Um, it can happen to you even though you've had relatively mild uh, symptoms when you first got the disease. It's much more common in women uh, and people can find that they're short of breath, exhausted, difficulty with you know remembering, concentrating, uh, difficulty exercising, and that can go on for months and it can be really nasty. So I would love to see and, and you know, people are, are measuring this. We just haven't got the information yet because they haven't been out long enough. Uh, do, will the vaccines prevent against long COVID? You would suspect that if they're preventing against infection as well as they are, uh, as we sh I showed in the previous slides, that they will also protect against long COVID. Um, but we don't know for that for sure yet. Okay, next really, really, really important question. And I think this is a really interesting one. So will COVID, will the vaccine prevent uh, me from passing COVID on to my family. So this is a very real question for me. I work in a hospital. I look after COVID patients. Uh, I would have had very high risk of picking up COVID over the last year. Um, and when I got the vaccine, you know, it would be lovely to know how safe am I then to, to come home and interact uh, with my family. 
which obviously I've been doing because I, you can't not. Um, but for example, could I go and visit my older parents? My mom has Alzheimer's. Would I be safe to go and visit her? And you would hope most, almost all vaccines that we have, um, like the measles vaccine, for example, do prevent transmission. But we weren't, we still aren't a hundred percent sure um, with COVID. And the reason that we're reluctant to say for sure that it definitely does prevent transmission is if we say it does and people who are vaccinated stop wearing masks, stop being careful, and then they do transmit it on, um, that has very serious consequences. So even though we've got very good reasons to think that the vaccines will prevent people from transmitting COVID on to their clients, to their families, uh, to their contacts, we don't know that 100% for sure yet. And um, so for the moment, we're advising people to keep wearing masks and keep distancing even after they've had the COVID vaccine. The early results, so these are results that have just come out from the UK, uh, seem to indicate that, yes, this is the Pfizer vaccine again, that, yes, these vaccines will prevent transmission onwards. Um, but the, the reason that everybody's being slow to say that for sure is because we're all worried about getting the answer to that one wrong and uh, people stopping wearing their masks and suddenly we have and more outbreaks. OK, next question. And this is a really important, important one. How long does it take the vaccine to protect you? So we saw a lot of this in January um, as the healthcare workers in the hospitals were vaccinated, where people were vaccinated and then picked up COVID very quickly thereafter um, and got sick. So it takes a while for that immune response that we were talking about at the start. Uh, where your body learns to recognize the virus or bacteria, that takes two to four weeks to happen. Um, and with COVID vaccines, we're doing a booster. So to make sure that you're getting a really strong immune response, you're giving the vaccine twice. So you see the virus once, you have some immune response, and then we give you a booster. So you see it again, and you really learn how to recognize it. So we are saying that in total, um, you know, it probably takes until you've had that second dose for, for complete protection. But certainly from the experiences of my colleagues who got COVID after shortly after being vaccinated, it was much milder than their family members who hadn't been vaccinated, for example. So you're probably getting some protection right away, but you do need to be careful in the few weeks following vaccination when you're not your immune response hasn't developed fully yet and you're not fully protected. OK, everybody's favorite question, what side effects does the vaccine have? So I suppose we have a relative short period of time. These vaccines have been out to see side effects happen in, but we have massive numbers of people worldwide who've been vaccinated and um, who their side effects have been checked in. So about two million people globally have had one of the COVID vaccines so far. Um, and most vaccine problems that happen after vaccines happen very quickly. So we can be fairly happy with that, those massive numbers uh, that there are no major immediate side effects that are common that we don't know about. So what does happen very, very, very commonly, and they're really signs that your immune system is being switched on and the vaccine is working, are feeling like you have a flu or a cold for a couple of days. Uh, I had this myself, the soles of my feet even hurt after I got my second dose of the Pfizer vaccine. It was really like having a flu. And that's because what makes you feel sick when you have the flu is your immune system fighting the flu. And when you have a vaccine, your immune system is being switched on. And so I actually was really glad to have the symptoms because for me, it meant that I knew that I had got the vaccine and that my immune system was learning how to fight the virus and was, was going to be able to recognize it. So temperature headaches, muscle ache, joint aches, very, very typical. Um, you know, make sure you have your neurofin at home. Make sure you're not booked in for work uh, for the day or two after the vaccine if you can avoid it. Um, some people had some diarrhea and vomiting. Those are much less common. And my arm was a bit sore after after both uh, doses. But to be honest, these are signs that your immune system are working, uh, they pass, take a neurofin, stay in bed, watch a bit of Netflix, and um, they, they will pass and, and they're not serious. And compared to the people that I've seen with COVID, I'm sure most of you have somebody that you know with COVID, you definitely uh, can be a heck of a lot sicker with COVID and it can last a heck of a lot longer than the vaccine side effects. The only serious side effect that has been noted so far is anaphylaxis. So anaphylaxis is what people, for example, with a peanut allergy can get when they eat peanuts or seafood. It's where your face swells up, your tongue swells up. And if you are not uh, able to use an EpiPen um, and to get medical care, sometimes that can be really dangerous and it can be life threatening. So it's about one in 100,000. So you would expect in Ireland, we've got 6 million. So we might get 60 people in Ireland altogether uh, that have this reaction to COVID vaccines. 
out of the whole country and it's very treatable so you that's why the vaccines are given in monitored settings and if somebody gets this uh, then you can give them their EpiPen. All the people that I have heard of who had who got anaphylaxis from the vaccine were people who already had had anaphylaxis from peanuts or seafood or whatever. And um, so they were well used to it and they all already carried an EpiPen. So it seems to only be a problem in people who already have this very, very severe type of allergy. This isn't your normal allergy. This is a very small uh, percentage of people with allergies who have anaphylaxis. Okay, we're rattling through this now. What about these new variants? Um, so basically, I every time the virus copies, it changes a little bit. Uh, it's like Chinese whispers. I like this one. So he thinks he's got bugs in his mask. The next fellow thinks you need gas and he, he wants to go fast. So every time the virus copies itself, it makes little mistakes. And most of them, was, those mistakes either do nothing or they make the virus weaker. And so the virus with those mutations dies out the other ones keep copying on. But what can happen if you've enough virus uh, in people and there's you know millions and millions and millions of, of coronaviruses in people at the moment, some of those mutations will give the virus an edge, will, will help it be more effective. And the worry, now we're dealing with this UK variant which spreads more easily. And um, so it's a pain in the arse to deal with because it's really spready. But what we're worried about is that some variants, um, ones in South Africa and in Brazil, it seems that that both natural immunity and virus immunity to them doesn't protect as well as it did. So what's happened is the bit of the virus that your immune system recognizes has changed and your immune system isn't able to recognize the virus as quickly or as strongly. Um, and that's a worry. Uh, it's not a reason not to get a vaccine at all. In fact, the more people we vaccinate, uh, the quicker we will get to the point where we're not having lots of virus copying and mutating. Um, and we can modify the vaccines. We can change the little bits of virus to match what is in these new variants. But obviously it's not something you want to happen. So globally and nationally, we need to be careful about trying to keep on top of these variants. And now I'm gonna let Austin do his talk and then we can come back for some questions. Thank you, Dermot. Thanks so much, Kalina. Uh, that, that was great. Uh, Kalina, Kalina said, we're gonna move on to um, Davina, I'm going to ask you to present Austin's press so we can see Austin in his full glory. My name is Dr. Austin O'Carroll. I am the HSE clinical lead for the COVID homeless response. I am here today to talk to you about coronavirus frequently asked questions about the vaccine. Apologies for not being able to be in person at this moment. But the reason is this afternoon, we are vaccinating the over 85 year olds in my own practice. I have 40 very happy and excited 85 year olds coming in to get their vaccines. Before I start my talk, I want to just tell you about me getting the vaccination. If there is anyone who knows about the side effects of medicine, it is me. My mother took the thalidomide drug and as a result, I was born with deformed legs and deformed arms. I wasn't able to walk till I was five and I had eight operations before the age of 14 in and out of hospital, all because of this medication. At this stage, I've reduced walking distance. I can just walk 50 yards because of the effects of thalidomide. So I am really wary about taking medication because I know and I don't trust uh, pharmaceutical companies i know the effects i have taken the vaccination because i've reviewed the evidence and vaccines are the safest drugs you can take i also take an approach of balancing risks the risks of side effects from vaccines are very low there are some side effects every medicine everything has side effects with vaccine they're very few so the risks are very low the risks of not taking the vaccine are very high one in five people with COVID infection become very ill and there's a high mortality rate. So on a simple balancing of risks, taking the vaccines makes so much sense. And that is why I have taken my vaccine. What is a vaccine and how does it work? Vaccine prevent diseases that can be dangerous or deadly. They basically work with your normal defences in your system by helping your immune response have the ability to react quickly when the virus comes in. As Kleena has already explained, it 
allows antibodies to be created by your immune system that attack the virus as soon as it enters your body so that you can prevent infection or reduce your infection. The big thing about vaccines is they're not about treatment, they're about prevention. And often we underestimate the effect and power of vaccines because when you have a severe infection to give an antibiotic, you can see, oh, that antibiotic stopped that severe infection. When you prevent the infection, no one sees it. So no one realizes the true power of vaccines. What are the benefits of getting the COVID-19 vaccination? It will prevent most people getting COVID, COVID infection. And of those who do get infected, it will prevent those getting severe infections and it has almost definitely prevents death. Vaccinations doesn't prevent all infections, but for, it prevents many of them. But for those who do get infected, you're, you have much less chance of a severe infection and almost no chance of death with, with, the, with the vaccinations. Wearing masks and social distancing help lower your chance of getting the virus, of spreading it to others. But these measures aren't enough. Vaccination improves these abilities to prevent us getting infection and prevent us spreading infection to other people. How do we know if the vaccine is safe? Vaccines go through more testing than any other pharmaceuticals. First, small groups of people receive the trial vaccine to make sure there's no serious side effects. Next, the vaccine is given to specific groups of people for those of a certain age, race or physical health, so as to make sure that it isn't just healthy people, that it also is tested out on all sorts of different people. Then it's given to tens of thousands of people and tested both for safety and effectiveness. The European Medicine Agency reviews all the evidence prior to deciding whether to approve the vaccine to member nations. And after that, the Health Products Regulatory Authority in Ireland looks at the data to see whether the vaccine works and is safe and decides whether to approve the vaccine. Vaccine is only approved after all of those steps are taken and the experts are sure that it is safe and that it works. People ask, how can it be safe if it happens so fast? This is the quickest vaccine we have ever produced. However, we gotta realize that when this infection affected the whole world, the whole world focused its resources to develop a vaccine as quickly as possible. The timeline was sped up, but cor corners were never cut. We already had helpful information about coronaviruses from work done in China, so we weren't starting from scratch. National governments across the globe invested a lot of money to support vaccine companies with their work. A lot of people participated in clinical trials and we didn't need to spend time finding volunteers. And manufacturing happened at the same time as safety studies, so vaccines were ready to be distributed as soon as they were approved. So it was about being efficient. Corners weren't cut to prevent safety. Can I get COVID-19 from the COVID-19 vaccines? No, the vaccines do not contain the live virus that causes COVID-19. This means you can't catch COVID-19 from the vaccine. Do the, do the COVID-19 vaccines have serious side effects? Serious side effects from vaccines, including the COVID-19 vaccine, are very rare. Some people have side effects due to the fact that they're developing an immune response such as that your body is building protection. These will often cause symptoms such as tiredness, headache, pain at the injection site, muscles or joint points, chills, nausea, vomiting, or fever. Serious side effects are very rare. The AstraZeneca only has a serious side effect in one in 100,000 people. The Madonna vaccine is only seen a serious side effects in one in a million people, and the Pfizer-BioNTech, one in 100,000. Most of those serious side effects are anaphylaxis reactions, that severe allergy where you collapse. And we are able to treat anaphylaxis and able to be, have the medicines there and then. So when you're getting your vaccination, if there is this rare anaphylaxis, we have the medicines there to treat you. There are other extremely rare side effects, such as Bell's palsy, which is a facial paralysis, but is that is reversible. Um, but these are extremely rare. They are much rarer than the dangerous effects of COVID, which can cause shortness of breath, lung damage, death, and also cause other serious skin manifestations, long COVID syndrome. So you've got to always look at balancing risks. 
and the risks are so much higher if you have COVID. Should someone with allergies get the COVID vaccination? You should not get the vaccine if you have a history to severe allergic reaction to any of the ingredients in the vaccines. If you know you have an allergic reaction to any strange items that may be in the vaccine, tell the doctor and they will be able to check. These are extremely rare. The vaccine don't contain eggs, preservatives or latex. If you have a history of severe allergic reaction to something else that's not in the vaccine, for example, peanuts, you can get the vaccine, but you need to let the doctor know because they will keep you for a longer period of observation. So whereas most people have to be kept for 15 minutes, you'll be kept for 13 minutes. You want to have a baby one day. Is it safe to get the COVID vaccine? Now, yes. People who are trying to become pregnant now or who plan to become pregnant in the future can get the COVID-19 vaccine when it becomes available to them. As we know now, and it really is, the, uh, the, the, we, the, the, the knowledge today shows that there is no effect on fertility or on the future effects of any children in the future. And we also know it doesn't make rational sense that these particular vaccines could cause a problem. We know they don't enter the DNA or have any interaction with DNA. Should someone who is pregnant or breastfeeding get a COVID-19 vaccine? Pregnant women between 14 and 33 weeks are being offered the vaccination. When trials are first done, they often don't include pregnant women. But what often happens is you do it in such large amount of people that someone ends up becoming pregnant. And then you gather evidence. And we know from that evidence that, in fact, very few pregnant people were, they had no side effects. They subsequently did trials on pregnancy, taking having this evidence. And again, to date, we are finding no serious effects in pregnant women. The reason we are saying 14 and 33 weeks is not because we know the side effects outside these times. It's just we know that miscarriages are very common before 14 weeks and people have premature labor after 33 weeks. And there is often a risk that people may think it's associated with the vaccination. So it's like a caution, a caution, a precaution that's been taken. Um, being vaccinated reduces the chance of a pregnancy becoming unwell. And we know that when people develop high temperatures or infections, that that can cause effects such as premature labor. And so that COVID vaccination should protect against these risks. Do I need to wear a mask and close contact with others if I've received two doses of the vaccine? Yes, you do. Why? Well, first of all, you have protection from being infected, a very good protection, a much reduced chance of infection. However, some people will be infected. As I said before, if you are infected, it's extremely unlikely to be a severe infection and almost no risk of dying from it, unlike if you haven't been vaccinated. But there's still that risk of infection and safe distancing reduces and masks reduce the chances of any infection. Secondly, we do not yet know if having the vaccine prevents spread. There is evidence that it does prevent spread, but we don't know how much. So to keep other people safe, you need to protect us the principles of infection control, such as wearing masks, keeping your distance and washing your hands. By putting chemicals in my body, am I less likely to be able to fight off other infections that I don't usually take antibiotics unless I really have to? The COVID vaccine doesn't affect your ability to fight off other infections. It does not weaken the immune system. It strengthens it. Here is the evidence from in the last 20th century, the annual death rate from smallpox was 29,000, diphtheria 21,000, measles 530,000. This was reported as zero once you actually had the um, once people had vaccinations. As you can see, the mumps vaccination, the numbers of people affected was hugely decreased once you had the vaccination. Same for whooping cough, that's pertussis. Same with polio, rubella, congenital rubella syndrome and tetanus. These were all hugely reduced once you had vaccination. Will we know in advance what vaccine we are getting so the staff members can look into that particular vaccine? We cannot guarantee you will know which vaccine you will get. If we are in a position to inform you, we let you know. Differing vaccinations have differing advantages. We know, for example, the Pfizer-BioNTech one has a 90% 90 effectiveness. What that means is that if you take two groups of people, if you take a, 
and you vaccinate one group and you don't vaccinate the other group, the actual group that have the vaccination will have a 90% reduction in new cases compared to the non-vaccinated group. So Pfizer-BioNTech is 90%, but needs to be stored at incredibly cold temperatures. So it's very difficult to distribute it. And you have to bring people to where the actual vaccine is. The Moderna, again, 95% effectiveness, but still needs to be stored at cold temperatures. The AstraZeneca has less protection, but they think it's up as high as 82%. This is extremely still extremely effective. For example, many vaccines that we use are up to only 60% effective. And But the great advantage of the AstraZeneca is you can actually store it and go around to people and bring it up. Bring, you can bring it in your car to places. So it's much more portable and it's much more easy to administer vaccine. The Sputnik vaccine actually is very effective and actually very uh, easy to distribute as well, interestingly enough. What about staff who have underlined in, in immunosuppressive conditions? Uh, all, all the studies have been on healthy people. Is that the case? The vaccines are not live vaccines, so they do not affect people who are immunosuppressed. In other words, you can't get an infection from the COVID vaccination. And just because you have immunosuppression doesn't mean you're any more likely. You just can't get an infection from the vaccination. It doesn't affect your immunity towards other infections either. The one thing is, though, because immunosuppressed people are not as effective in eff developing an immune reaction, it does mean that the actual anti the effectiveness of the vaccine will not be as strong in immunosuppressed people. However, they will still be better able to resist infection than if they had not got the vaccine. And immunosuppressed people need every bit of protection they can get. So it makes absolute sense for them to get the vaccine. Can you get one vaccine and not get the other? Yes, but you will have reduced immunity and it was probably, we don't know, but it's probably the immunity won't, will be last for a shorter period of time. I want to just talk about, we're going back to vaccinations and just to say about the effectiveness on them. And I want to just go back to smallpox. Smallpox was a deadly disease. If you want to actually have nightmares, look up on the internet for pictures of people who've had smallpox. It's like chicken pox multiplied by 10. It's horrific when you actually see it on people. The risk of death after contracting smallpox was about 30%. One in three people almost died with higher rates among babies. Of those who survived, they had extensive scarring of the skin and some were left blind. Again, if you look at the pictures, you'll understand why they had such scarring. Smallpox killed about 300 million people in the 20th century alone and 500 million in the 100 years prior to when it was eradicated. It was eradicated in 1980 due to the smallpox vaccination. Vaccines have done incredible things in terms of reducing infections. Diphtheria, we've had a hunt. This is in the US. There was a 100% reduction in cases and in deaths. Measles, a 99.9% .9 reduction in cases, 100% reduction in deaths. Look at mumps, whooping cough, polio, paralytic polio. Polio in the early 20th century was a horrific disease and very common. We almost never see it now. I, I, the only people I see with polio are people who got it. They're, they're old people. You don't see young people with polio. So you got to remember, vaccines have transformed our lives. So vaccines are probably one of the best medicines we've ever, ever developed. This is the number of child deaths per year from 1990 by cause of death in the world. And if you look at the cause of death, the, the coloured ones are where actual vaccinations were responsible for the reduction in deaths internationally. That was tetanus, whooping cough, measles, meningitis, diarrheal diseases and acute respiratory infections. Will all staff and clients be asked to take the vaccine? Yes. Why? First of all, it prevents anyone getting a severe infection and almost guarantees no deaths from COVID-19 in staff or clients. There is also evidence that the vaccination reduces the spread of infection. The more people vaccinated, the more likely we are to eliminate or greatly reduce the harms of the infection. And every day you and your body are exposed to viruses and virus particles. Your body develops immunity to these even if they are harmless. Vaccines are just safe. Viruses are parts of viruses that enable you to protect yourself. There's this idea that oh, the vaccination, it's like something weird. 
there's loads of viruses all around you you're exposed to and simply particles of viruses all the time. So this is just part, we're just adjusting what happens normally to give you protection. This is how the concept of community protection. So when you vaccinate, it's not just about you, you're also helping other people in your community. If you see, if you give poor vaccination coverage, you don't get herd immunity because there isn't enough people to prevent spread. If most people vaccinate themselves, they prevent herd immunity. They, they get herd immunity and prevent infection. So really, if you want to help your community, get vaccinated. How long after getting the COVID-19 vaccine does it take to be effective and how long does it last? It takes usually a few weeks for the body to develop immunity. Uh, different vaccines have different lengths of time. Um, someone could be infected just before or just after vaccination and get sick because this the vaccination has had time to take effect. We don't know along how they take provide infection from getting sick, even if you do get COVID-19. However, we constantly getting knowledge and we do think it seems to be a long time that there is actually protection. Will a COVID vaccine change my DNA? No. COVID is, is a thing called messenger RNA. It doesn't interact with DNA. Um, they were the first vaccines abused in the, 19, the United States. They teach our immune system how to fight against a specific virus. It doesn't need to get into the DNA to work. So no, just simply it doesn't get into your DNA. Thalidomide, interestingly, that's the drug my mother took, does affect DNA. So I am really careful about this issue. Vaccines, these vaccines don't get into DNA. So it's someone who has already got COVID, you know, previously got COVID or is COVID positive, should they get the vaccination? Yes, they should be offered the COVID vaccines as the level of and duration of immunity after natural infection is not known. But vaccination should be deferred until clinical recovery from the COVID vaccine for at least four weeks since diagnosis or onset of symptoms or four, yeah, four weeks since a positive test. Yes, yeah, so definitely you should get the vaccination. What about new variants? There's a number of new variants we're worried about. A UK or Kent variant, sorry, go back to that. Um, a South African variant and the, the variant from Brazil. For the, while most vaccines, the variants don't seem to increase mortality, there is some evidence that the UK variant may have a 30% higher risk of, of death. Uh, the evidence isn't strong, not data enough is, is known. Current vaccines were developed around the, the original version of the coronaviruses. However, all the evidence coming through seems to show that they work against the new ones, though, though maybe not quite as well. The Pfizer-BioNTech still has very good protection, but is slightly less effective. Same from the, the AstraZeneca, um, that it protects just as well, though it mightn't work against the South Africa variant as well. And the Moderna, um, vaccine is effective against the South Africans, though immune response may not be as strong as long lasting. In all of these, though, it really seems that death is still very, very well protected against and very unlikely, even with the new variants. So while the, 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 the chance of infection may be higher, the chance of severe infection is still very low and death still almost insignificant. When you're getting vaccination, we know that certain people will be prioritized based on them having certain conditions. And these are the conditions. There's cancer, chronic kidney disease, chronic neurological disease, chronic respiratory disease, diabetes, inherited metabolic diseases, intellectual disability, obesity, and sickle cell disease. We know these diseases significantly add to your risk of death if you have COVID. And that's why those are the ones we'll be targeting first. So my final piece of advice is take the vaccination. It will protect you. It will protect your loved ones. It will protect your homeless clients. It will protect your community. It is safe. I And another thing I ask of you, my experience, I've been doing vaccinations in homeless people since 2005. And I, whenever I visit a hostel, I know within around 10 minutes what the uptake in the hostel will be. And how I know what the uptake in the hostel will be will be the enthusiasm of the staff. If I come and see unmotivated staff, I know I'm going to find clients still in bed, not getting up, not interested in taking the vaccine. Where I go to hostels where staff have been motivated, they've been on the clients to take the vaccination, they've been telling clients how important it is to take the vaccination, they've got them out of bed in the morning, they have incredible uptakes of vaccination. So 
The success of the vaccination campaign, it depends on the enthusiasm and the work of the staff. So please, please, please promote this vaccination to your clients. It is the one thing that will keep them safe and help us escape this. Thank you very much for listening to me. If you have any queries, I don't make it t- make, mind taking emails and I'll be joining the question section at the end of this as well. And um, very nice to talk to you as well. Good to see you and thank you so much for joining us. Um, so look, for everybody who's joined us, I hope those presentations were of some use. Um, as I've said, we have the Q&A section down at the bottom. We're going to start trying to get through some of the questions for the next 10 or 15 minutes. We'll run a little over because we started a little late. Austin, I'm sure he'll be happy about that because he's vaccinated. Before, before you do, uh, Dermot, I just want to show you, this is the vaccine. <laughs> We're actually uh, vaccinating all our over 70s and there's it's like a party atmosphere out in the corridor. Everyone's so happy. But now well, you're over seventies, right? Austin. Sorry, you're over eighty-five. Oh. Over eighty-five. Okay, sorry, the over seventies. Yeah. Not at all. Austin is always blagging at and doing the over seventies when he's only meant to be doing the over eighty-fives. Um, but what I'd say is. Thank you so much for those presentations. I think um, you really, you really got through some of the questions, and we may have some repeat questions because people are sending in questions, so they may not have heard something or, or whatever. So I'd really like to try and answer as much. So I'm gonna, I'm literally just gonna start at the start um, and throw out the first question. And the first question I have is for either on the panel: If you're immune compromised, is there any specific vaccine you should receive? No, not I haven't. Yeah. And like Austin said, they may not work quite as well in somebody who's immunocompromised than who isn't. Uh, but people who are immunocompromised need the vaccine more than anybody else. So definitely every ounce of, of protection kind. Super. So you heard that you heard that from the horses now here. If you're immune compromised, take the vaccine and anyone will, will do. So the next question I have is coming up that um, why is AstraZeneca only 60% effective for under 65? Um, the evidence is coming through that, I mean, first of all, all vaccinations have different effectiveness levels. And in fact, most vaccines that we have, a lot of them are actually only around 60%. Um, why one vaccine works better than another, it's very hard to be, to be clear. Um, but, but, but the actual evidence I've seen is that for over for under 65s, that the actual rates are getting better than, than the 65%. So they think it's a higher percentage at the moment for the AstraZeneca uh, and further studies will be done. But the good news is even that the 65% just means you're 65% less likely to get an infection. However, you're much less likely to get a severe infection. And okay. also almost it almost eradicates the, 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 the risks of death. So it still has a much higher effect on the severe infections and the death. And that's really where you want the impact. Great. Yeah, 100% um, uh, efficacy on preventing severe illness and death with the AstraZeneca and with all the others. So it's a good vaccine for that. Excellent. And um, the next the next question is one we're not going to answer here, but because it's on the list, I'm just going to name it so people know they may want to go back and ask this. And is it mandatory to be vaccinated in healthcare settings? That's not a question for us to answer. Being clear, that's, that's no. A so the HSE are working on guidelines. It's something we're struggling with yeah. at the moment. Um, and yeah, watch this space. Yeah, great. Um, so the next question is: What are the long term effects of the vaccine, and how can we know? if it hasn't been researched for long enough? Um, first of all, is um, the long-term effects of any medicine uh, come out after you can't, you can't know till a long time after. However, um, the long-term effects after vaccines have always been very few. There have been some queries about vaccines which have been found subsequently to be not due to the vaccine. So there will always be queries because take, for example, um, autism was one that they queried um, with the vaccine. And it was because autism tends to appear at the same time that everybody got vaccinated. So someone says autism was diagnosed a few weeks and I got the vaccine a few weeks ago. So that's how the association happens. So we don't know the side effects. We, they are very unlikely to be any serious side effects long term, but we have to wait. But it's extremely unlikely. Okay. Would that be fair, Cleona? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, vaccines very rarely have kind of side effects that appear late. Um, so uh, you wouldn't be expecting there to be anything major. And the massive numbers being vaccinated globally means that you'll we have a good chance of picking up side effects quickly. Okay. Next question I have here is, I have a, I have a pen, penicillin allergy, clearly not a doctor, can't even say penicillin, um, with serious consequences. And I know there's concern with allergies and vaccine. I've heard numerous, a pl- numerous rumors of plenty that those with a penicillin allergy shouldn't take any of the vaccines, but can't find any authoritative advice on this online uh, or on the COVID hub, read this. Could you provide any information on this, please? So Austin already did that in his talk. He covered it. Um, so yeah, mm-hmm. penicillin allergy is fine. Just, you know, it'd be monitored for 30 minutes rather than 15 minutes, but there's no penicillin in the vaccine. Great. So that, those people that have pen- penicillin allergies, you're good to go. You'll be monitored for longer. Um, so the next one is, I tested positive for COVID in the middle of January. Should I still get vaccinated or do I already have memory cells which will protect me for the next few months? So we don't know is the answer to that. Um, but on the chance that natural immunity isn't as protective as vaccine, we're recommending that people who have COVID still get the vaccine. But they, they have to wait the eight, four, four, four weeks, weeks. To contract the, vac- the, the, um, the, the COVID and that they're asymptomatic. Obviously. OK, asymptomatic and four weeks host contraction of COVID, you're good to, you're good to be vaccinated again. Okay, yeah. next question. Austin, this this is one you might be able to help with. Um, will hostel residents get vaccinated at the same time as staff? Okay, I'm, we're not in charge of this. We really want hostel staff and, and clients to be done at the same time, um, both for protection and also purely because when we're going to a hostel, we can't be going back and forth. It's quite a big operation going out. So we're fighting that they be done at the same time, but... We're not the bosses. Perfect. So that's it. We don't know, but we're trying our best to get it done for everybody. Yeah. Okay. And Next we've done question. well so far in getting things. So which would <laughs> really have, really have. The next question is more a broad question, and it's do you get the presentations as well? All the participants can have access to the presentations. Austin, I'm sure, will make his available clean as we already have, and we'll send a link out so that they can be accessed. Um, for yeah. within the poll, we'll do it through Moodle Monday, and where our partner agencies will send them out as an attachment with the link right. for the video. Next question: uh, Member, a member of my team is concerned about potential fertility issues. It's already been answered in the presentation. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Because I know it's a thing that I have a slide. You did, uh, and, and yeah, Austin cause... named it as well. Baby making is still good to go. I think Austin, you clarified that in your presentation. Yeah, well, you just look for a slide. Just say there's no effect of fertility. No. Yep, and that's just the BMJ, which is like the biggest journal for doctors in the UK, just came out saying no evidence that vaccines can affect fertility. So exactly what Austin said. Great. Hopefully that reassures people. No evidence and no reason why the way that the vaccines work, they're. They wouldn't be doing anything that would affect your fertility. So the next question I have is the vaccines uh, we're being offered is only protecting from one variant. Will we be expected to get numerous vaccines each year as well as boosters thereafter? So we don't know yet is the answer to that one, Dermot. I mean, we get our flu jab every year. And again, I'll happily get it every year rather than getting the flu every year, which is horrible. Um, so we may, worst case scenario, you'll have to get a vaccine every year. Best case scenario, one vaccine will do you. And we don't know yet. The, the chances are that they'll adapt the vaccines that they have at present to take account of new variants. Because that's what they do with the flu jab. Mm-hmm. Every year they bring out a new version of the flu jab to take into account new variants. So the chances are that it will be still one jab. Okay. And I think we're, we're relation to the fact that it's only effective against one variant. That's not actually the case based on your presentation. Your presentation talked about does a reduced efficacy, but it's still a strong efficacy. There's still a strong effectiveness against all the press variants. Uh, it varies from variant to variant. But going back to the flu vaccine, people may not realise that we get different flu vaccines every year, which has actually got um, vaccinations in them against several variants. Because the flu has way more variants than COVID. 
So we, we've been doing this for years. So I wouldn't be too worried about the variants. No, I mean, if the, the effectiveness of the present ones is extremely good to the variants. If there's new variants, we'll be able to address it. Okay. So the next question uh, is a query re which vaccines are being rolled out. Um, if it's AstraZeneca, is it suitable for older populations as there are reports in some EU countries that it's not being used for this population? So the reason that Ireland and some other UK uh, countries held off using AstraZeneca in older people was that the trials that AstraZeneca did didn't have enough older people in it. So this is, I'm always trying to teach my medical students this, but sometimes we don't know something, like there just isn't the evidence to tell us one way or the other. And sometimes we have evidence that something doesn't work. So in the case of AstraZeneca, it wasn't that we had any evidence that it didn't work. We just didn't have enough evidence that it did work. Um, so that's why they decided to hold off and use the Pfizer there. So this is a lack of, lack of data as opposed to a problem with the vaccine? At this Absolutely. Point. Yeah. It was just whatever way they had designed the trials, they didn't have enough older people in them. Okay. Austin, is there anything you want to add there? No, that's exactly it. Yeah. And we're just using oh. the Pfizer. That's what we're doing this afternoon, using the Pfizer and other people are using the Moderna. Right. And um, the next question's already been answered and it was around boosters and people having to get boosters. Maybe we don't know, or if they do, it's better than um, getting the flu as Kleena points out. The next question is, will there be a need to get vaccines annually? So that's two with the boosters. I'm reading these live, so you'll bear with me. Austin has to go soon. I have to go quickly. Um, so this is more of a statement and I wouldn't mind uh, hearing from the doctors on it. It says statistics for COVID are unrealistic. Deaths are over-recorded, possible, probable, and actual COVID cases are all recorded as COVID related. Death toll records in 2019 and 2020 do not show a huge rise in deaths as the media are portraying. People who have died from heart failure and stroke have been recorded as COVID. I'm just curious if you have any opinion on that as people that are working directly with people that have COVID. So, Dermot, I just put um, a little fact checker thing link in there. So the, the journal.ie do these like fact checking things. So actually that data around there being fewer deaths is is not accurate. It's to do with the way deaths are recorded and reported. Um, certainly, yeah, I, I've, I've seen a lot of people die directly from COVID um, and yeah. Okay. I, it's it's incontrovertible right, for me. There may be some people whose deaths have been reported as being from COVID who died of something else who happened to have COVID, um, but there also will be deaths where we didn't know that COVID was involved. Um, so you also yeah. got to remember you got to remember that someone who's got heart failure, for example, if they got COVID, um, the COVID will cause the heart failure to worsen. So you could say, oh, is it heart failure that killed them? But or is it COVID? But the heart failure wouldn't go worse if it happened for the COVID infection. This is the same for flu. Yeah. Um, people with lung disease, you know, they, it may get much worse when they've got the flu or COVID. Is it the COVID or the lung disease? You know, they wouldn't have died if they hadn't got the COVID. So, yeah. Okay. So, look, and I think, I think that that's the reality. You guys are on the front line. You guys are seeing a, a, an increase in, in the deaths that relate specifically to COVID. Particularly in homeless people, actually, Dermot. And I think we, I mentioned that before. So, amazing work done by everybody on this call in preventing people from getting home, homeless people from getting COVID, um, which has just been fabulous. But of those who have got it, um, they do tend to get very severely unwell and are at increased risk of dying. So we've had, I think, three or four deaths in the last month of homeless people from COVID in James's. So, yeah. So um, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I've made a decision to deliver not bet any of these questions. I am skipping somewhere we've answered them. Um, but, uh, how can we be sure that the COVID vaccine done within a year won't have long-term side effects? We've already named that. We can't, but we're confident based on previous experience that the side effects should be relatively minimal. Can, and I, can I make a point of that, Dermot, too? Is yeah. yeah. People are presuming that there isn't long-term side effects to COVID. There's much more likely to be long-term side effects to COVID. And so if you're going to ask the question about the vaccine, you have to ask the same question about the infection. And that's much more likely to have some long-term side effects. So okay. it's all balancing risk. People have to understand taking medication and vaccines is about balancing risk. The risks of COVID are huge. The risks of vaccines are, are, are much lower. Right. If there is, a, there is a question here, and I want to answer it. Um, and I'll pour it out. 
and then I'll explain where I want to answer. It says, do Kleena and Austin have any conflict interests? And I want to be really clear. This is the Paul Lunch and Learn. Um, and we in the Paul value Austin and Kleena's expertise and advice on this subject. So I'm I'm saying that we, we have no concerns around their conflicts. Just to clarify, German, I think it's a fair question. Absolutely yeah. fair question. I, I, I would not object to the question. Clarify, I have no conflict of interest. I have no pecuniary interest from the vaccine. I have no um, financial gain. I mean, I took the vaccine. So, yeah. Yeah, so you have an interest, but not a conflict. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I, yeah, I have no financial benefits or anything. I have no stocks in, in the companies. And uh, yeah, my interest is just in seeing people not get sick. And Fair, I took the and, vaccine. I pushed other people out of the way in the queue to get to the top of the queue. Yeah. And, and I, I would argue probably your greatest conflict is wanting to ensure that homeless people and those with most mm -hmm. complex needs are supported and kept safe. We're nearly there, Austin, because I know you need to leave, but we'll get through a couple more. Um, and it says here, um, could natural or global immuni immunization, like in Sweden, be more efficient or, and less dangerous getting the vaccine? So I think if you look at Sweden, they their outcomes are horrendous. They've had like thousands, tens of thousands more deaths than their neighbour Finland. Um, and uh, they had hoped that they would see the benefit of herd immunity from natural infection and they didn't. I, I also go back to um, go back to smallpox, diphtheria. Natural, natural immunity never occurred and there was thousands of deaths. Vaccines, yeah. you know, it, made, it, it just doesn't make sense. Look at, look at the previous history of vaccine. Okay, there is a there is a question about um, people that are considered category two E as front frontline workers and stuff like that. And what does what do the categories mean? We can't answer that here. It's a, it's a bit long, and we wouldn't have the time nor necessarily be the best people to answer that. I'd refer you back to the HSC for that one. Um, Just to say, as yeah. Austin said, you know, both Austin and I would have been advocating very strongly. Anybody that listened to us that. Um, Social care staff in homeless settings would be the equivalent of healthcare staff and should be prioritised. So the next one I have is, do nursing mothers who are breastfeeding and uh, who get the vaccine, will this give any protection against COVID for the baby? It will. Fantastic advantage to breastfeeding yeah. or getting vaccinated in pregnancy. Yeah, it's a really good way to protect babies. Yeah. Okay. And um, the next question is, my, my residents... Uh, here are concerned of the ingredients in vaccines such as formaldehyde, aluminium, aluminium parts, sorry, animal parts like brain, liver, kidney, etc. How much of this is truth and how much I can I alleviate their concerns? There's no animal parts that I'm aware of. Uh, I can't exactly say what's the only the ingredients. I'll be honest, is I tend to get a bit cynical about this. Like we're taking lots of chemicals, and you, you drink a fucking Fanta, and the amount of chemicals in Fanta, and our Don't body Fanta for people, Austin. What? Don't be ruining Fanta for people. <laughs> so I tend to think, as people get really caught up with these chemicals, these are just chemicals that are used long for vaccines for a long time. Um, so. Apologies, yeah, I'm under pressure here, Darren, but sorry. Austin, um, so, you, you feel free to step out. I'm sure I can keep Kleena for a few more minutes. And is she that okay, Kleena? And if you want yeah, anybody, anyone wants to email me stuff, fire ahead. But just, right. uh, yeah, I, I'll let Kleena take it, if that's okay. And it's yeah, no, no animal parts, no formaldehyde, and no alum in actually thanks, Austin. beans. Great. No one there are minuscule amounts of those in some other vaccines that we use, but not in these ones. Okay. Should I be concerned that the period of the clinical study was contracted from 10 years to less than a year? So this is really interesting, right? Because I was really concerned about this. And then I was doing a session with the medical students with one of my friends who is a big vaccine person. So the reason that this was much quicker is purely financial. So normally if you're developing a vaccine, you do a tiny step, then you have to go and look for more money. Then you do another tiny step and you have to go and look for more money. Then you test it in two people. Then you go and look for more money. You test it in five. And so they were able just because money was no issue. They were able to do skip all of those looking for money steps. So they haven't skipped. They haven't shortened the time that they've done things for and they haven't decreased the number of people that they looked for. They just did them like much more at the same time. Does that make okay. sense? 
Yes. Yeah, so, so in essence, they ran some things parallel. They ran things parallel and they didn't have the same gaps between things. And instead of having to show something in two people and then five people, they were able to go, right, we'll show it in a thousand and get it over and done with. OK. OK. So basically truncating the process, but not in any way damaging the veracity of the process. Yeah. Not shortening the time periods that people were followed for or not um, not requiring the same level of evidence that it works than any other vaccine they just right. money was no object excellent and Vani it was that way in all cases I know the next question I have actually is a good question maybe for yourself clean it and it's I'm just wondering uh, regarding your patients who are harmless are they receptive to getting the vaccine or is there some resistance and do you have strategies for dealing with any of the resistance to support people towards protecting themselves so this is a brilliant question and actually i'm going to flip this because you guys are all going to know better than me and um, no i haven't had much if any like you know when i've said to patients oh as soon as we get the vaccine we'll give you a call I haven't had anybody say no. In fact, I've had lots of text messages saying, is it there yet? Is it there yet? But I presume there will be people who are concerned. And I think there is a lot of stuff um, on social media that's really scary, which our patients will read the same way that everybody else will read. Um, and I think one of the other problems, we haven't seen it yet in Ireland, but in the UK and in the US, people from like ethnic minorities and poorer backgrounds are much more likely to refuse vaccines. So in the US, a lot of black people um, have said no to the vaccine. So we could well be seeing the same with homeless people. I My only approach is to try to listen to people's um, concerns. Like they're not doing it to be annoying. They're doing it because they're genuinely concerned and to yeah. share with them what I know. And I think it probably relates as well to what Austin talked about towards the end of his presentation. Like days like today are about equipping the staff and services with more yeah. knowledge so they can be more Absolutely. support service users as well, isn't it? That's critical. And I think, you know, if if um, the residents are seeing staff getting vaccinated and, you know, that they trust it for themselves, then that's really reassuring for the residents. In the same way, hopefully it's reassuring for people that like, I have my vaccine and Austin has his, you know, like we trust it enough to take it ourselves. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think, look, at we're, we're getting there. Clean it. We have a couple of questions to go. This is fun. Keep going. Yeah, I think um, we're starting. I see some eager questions here. When will we get done? I don't think we can answer that question for you. There obviously is a rollout process. And as I mentioned already, your categorization will come into it. It's important to be engaging uh, with your own organization. And they're working very hard. I'm, I'm not speaking for all the organizations, but I, I lobby with them for access to the vaccine our staff and our services yeah. with Clean and Austin. So um, where will you be done in a hostel or in another environment? Still to be confirmed. Again, I think Austin will be eager to, I, I think he mentioned it in his own presentation, he'd be eager to get out to the hostels in one sitting and do everybody in the hostels. Um, but it's it's a waiting game and that has to be agreed with the HSD at the rollout time. And now a really good question. Is there any possibility that the mRNA mRNA could have an, could have effects on other proteins in the body by mistake, either which is either good or bad. What I've read is that the RNA is automated messenger response in our bodies and automatically recognizes bad proteins in the body. It's a long question, but we'll keep going. And then it fights it off by adjusting the automated messenger response. Is there any possibility it could be confused with what is good and bad? Brilliant question. Um, almost at the level with the questions that I my kids ask me where I'm like, I have no idea. So this is the way I'm going to explain. This is the way I explain DNA and, and mRNA. So DNA is like your recipe book in your cells and it has zillions of recipes in there. OK, and then it's like, right, what are we having for dinner today? <laughs> and the mammy inside your cells picks out what recipe is actually going to be made. And, and that's what messenger RNA is. It's, it's like that particular recipe that then your cell makes that protein. So what we're doing, how the mRNA vaccine works is it's sticking that recipe into your cells for like a day. It, it, it degrades, it breaks down naturally. So what that's doing is that messenger RNA is giving your cells a recipe to make a protein, the spike protein that's on the virus. So for that day that you get the vaccine, some of your cells in your arm are making spoke, spike protein on their outsides. So it's not actually interfering with the recipe book. So that mRNA can't get into that long-term recipe book it's just like a little 
recipe card that gets broken down. I don't know if that analogy worked. I like Perfect. cooking. That's it's, why I have that recipe. It's a cooking, it's a cooking, um, a cooking metaphor during the lunch in there. We have three more minutes, and I'm just going to try and finish this off. Um, so it's a staff question around. I've been a close contact twice this year already, um, and I live with people that are in similar fields. Um, if we're vaccinated and designated a close contact, will we still have to self-isolate? So for the moment, yes, because we're not sure yet. We don't have the evidence yet. Like we were saying, we just don't have enough information yet to say for sure, no, you're grand. Um, in all likelihood, I would say in a few months, we'll be able to say, no, if you're vaccinated, you're fine. But we don't have that yet. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. For now, it's a yes in the same way as in Austin's presentation, PPE will still need to yeah. be worn. Absolutely. Start getting an understanding of how much disease isn't spreading as opposed to affecting us, then we'll, we'll know more and hopefully we'll see differences come up in due course. La last ones, regarding conditions, for example, is asthma. What would be deemed as a chronic asthma condition? It's coming up a lot from the service users. Yeah, I noticed that actually, because I was looking through the guidelines and I suppose what I would have loved to see was homelessness right up there as a condition, because as we all know, it has really serious effects on people's health, but it doesn't. So they say severe COPD and severe asthma. And by that, I would be thinking people who have to go to hospital with it, like who've had hospital admissions. But I'm not, I think it's up to each individual GP to decide that. But if you have somebody that has really bad lungs um, in your service, which I know a lot of you do have, uh, I would definitely suggest contacting their GP or contacting Safety Net and, and seeing if they could be vaccinated under that. The problem is that lots of people, like, I don't know, like my 12 year old has asthma and he uses an inhaler once a year. So that's why they had to put in the caveat about it being severe. OK, so it's GP assessment and, and they will have a good set of parameters. And, 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 you know, if you're in any way think that you might have somebody who might need a vaccine, ask. Great always welcome to check it we're nearly there so it's do you do you see an emotional slash mental well-being benefit in the people who have received their vaccination yes I, when that's talking about i suppose me personally and my colleagues there is a massive sense of relief and um, because i think and i'm sure it's the same for everybody on this call i who hasn't you haven't been vaccinated yet always at the back of your mind when you're going into work you think well I'm you know is today going to be the day when I get it and you push it to the back of your mind because you want to go in and look after your clients and do your job and um, but there definitely is a relief knowing that you're protected so I can't wait for you all to get vaccinated. Two more questions how common are the side effects of Bell's palsy? really rare so I had never heard of them until Austin mentioned them and um, so and I haven't like we've an infectious diseases consultants whatsapp group where we all report things so I would say as rare as hen's teeth okay. and there uh, again they happen to people sometimes randomly so it's always tricky to know was it the vaccine or was it just that that person was unlucky? yeah and I know Austin was indicating it's one in a hundred thousand that had some effects and he said that the effect of Bell's palsy was less than that so okay, so it's like maybe one person one. in the whole of Ireland then. Yeah, so it, it's significantly less than, 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 than that number he was indicating in his thing. And the last thing is more of a request, and I'll say yes to this from my side, which is um, can we do some, a similar service user webinar on info? Oh, I'd love that. And I knew you'd love that. Um, that would be cool. I'd love that. I bet we get brilliant questions. So what I will do is I will commit to setting up a webinar for service users over the next few weeks where we'll try and get Austin back. And you've heard from Shana, she will definitely come back. Quite and then you might want to look at like peer champions in the services. You know, if you've got somebody who's uh, very, you know, keen to help out, then maybe they can go around and rustle up their uh, co cohabitants. That's a great idea. Peer advocates. Let's call them peer advocates. So guys, um, thank you all for joining us today. I'd like to thank uh, Kalina and Austin who had to leave us because he's eagerly vaccinating the over 70s, he said. Um, but thank you so much for all the good questions. Um, and we really, really appreciate having you here today.